Hello and welcome to today's webinar presentation entitled Review Report and Revised Curriculum for the Undergraduate Accountancy Program at the University of Liberia. My name is Sandra Dreheim and I am the Marketing Manager for the William Davidson Institute who is hosting today's presentation. Today's session will present our Institute's recommendations for the University of Liberia's Undergraduate Accountancy Program. For all attendees today, I invite you to submit your questions during the webinar session by typing them into the dialog box on your screen and then pressing send. Our presenters will then verbally answer as many questions as possible either during or at the end of today's session. I am recording today's webinar and will provide all attendees with a link to it within one or two business days. I'd like to briefly introduce today's presenters. Dr. Dennis Oswald is a visiting assistant professor of accounting at the Ross School of Business at the University of Michigan. He has 14 years of teaching experience for executive education, graduate MBA, and undergraduate accounting courses at the London Business School, University of Illinois, and the University of Michigan. Professor Jeff Williams is lecturer of accounting at the Stephen M. Ross School of Business at the University of Michigan. He joined the faculty in 1996 and teaches financial accounting at the undergraduate and graduate levels and federal taxation at the graduate level. I'm happy to now turn over today's presentation to Dennis Oswald. Thank you, Sandra. Um, and thank you all for joining us today. Jeff and I are quite excited to be discussing the results of our review of the current UL undergraduate accountancy curriculum and we are particularly excited to explain our proposed revised undergraduate accountancy curriculum. It is our understanding that you have been provided with copies of both our review, which was deliverable one of the project, and our recommended curriculum, which is deliverable two. Throughout this presentation, we will be referring to tables in these reports, but we will be putting up slides of the actual tables on the screen here so you don't need the reports in front of you. We are also both really looking forward to hearing on your comments on what you've done, either through questions um, during this webinar or through follow-up feedback. We do believe that together we can make sure that we have the best possible curriculum for UL to have in the long term, which will lead to UL having an outstanding accountancy program. The focus of our discussion today is, of course, on the curriculum review and our proposed revised undergraduate accountancy curriculum. But the curriculum review and recommended curriculum are just part of a bigger overall project that WDI is doing for UL. Of course, the overall goal of this project for UL is to ensure that UL um, has a reputation as a modern, oops, sorry, has a reputation as a modern facility for training accountants. As I mentioned, our discussion today is really on the left-hand side of this overview screen, ensuring that UL has a state-of-art curriculum. There are other elements that need to be added to this that end up with the goal of developing UL as the modern facility for training accountants. Of course, there's the teaching and the having modern teaching pedagogy. This is a separate part of the WDI Bigger Project. This is Deliverable 3, and we'll be talking a little bit about this as it does link into the curriculum as we go through our presentation. But really, this covers the teaching workshops that were delivered in Ann Arbor by Professor Karen Bird, workshops that I delivered in my field visit to Liberia in March, and also the teaching practice manual that was sent to UL last week. The other elements that's not really going to be discussed today is getting input from the, public's, um, the private sector and other constituencies. And that really came in, in with uh, Robert Verum's field visit in January of this year where we've solicited that feedback. So when we tie all these things together, it should lead us up to UL having that reputation as a modern facility for training accountants. And I'm just stressing this because you know, today we're talking about the curriculum. 
it is all a part of a bigger plan, and I want to make sure that we, you know, as we put this all together, we are thinking of ticking all of the boxes. We're thinking about the teaching. We're thinking about having the right curriculum. We're thinking about what do our external constituents want. How does this all fit together? But of course, as I said, today is really the left-hand side of this slide. It's having the state of art curriculum. So to get to that point of having the state of art curriculum, we've done two main things. We've done a review of the current undergraduate accountancy program, and that's what I'm going to start with now. After this part of the presentation, we'll move to discussing our recommendations. The review process really started with our two field visits. The first of these visits was by Bob Virnum, who went to Monrovia, was out in Liberia in January of 2014. The purpose of his trip was to interact with the UL faculty and administration, as well as the wider business community, to get an understanding of the current situation facing the UL accounting, accounting department and its graduates. Briefly, the conclusion from his visit is that there's definitely a need for UL to strengthen its accountancy program, and with a strengthened accounting, accountancy program, it may be beneficial to the overall business community, and it should also enhance the overall standing of the university. The second field visit, of course, was my field visits to UL back in March of 2014. I want to say yet again um, what an outstanding trip this was for me, and I do want to thank everyone again for all of your hospitality. The primary purpose of my trip was to start to get a more thorough understanding of the current curriculum that's being used at UL and the constraints faced by the accounting departments. In addition to this, I was also there to look at other aspects of the teaching, which included things such as teaching materials, um, the student library, to see the computer lab, to get an understanding for the teaching methods that are used, the types of exams that are used. So all in all, to get a real thorough understanding of what the curriculum is, how it's being delivered, how it's being assessed, etc. But the other thing that really came out of my visit was really getting an understanding of the challenges that are being faced by the accountancy departments. And I'll briefly talk about the, you know, how I've summarized what I saw while I was there, but I do want to stress that as Jeff and I were going through and putting together our recommended curriculum, we were aware of these challenges and they really have influenced what we are suggesting and recommending. But the challenges are, First, that UL, or the accountancy department, has a large num there are a large number of students. As you all know, you've got thousands of accountancy students, and I'm not sure, and we're not sure, that all of these students are purely committed to being accountancy students and really want to be studying accounting. The second challenge is that there's a large number of part-time faculty, some of who a small number of who may not be fully committed and dedicated to their teaching responsibilities. And this has some impact on the quality of the program that's being delivered. And of course, finally, there's a serious lack of resources. This includes things such as access to textbooks, the ability to have audio-visual equipment in the classroom, and the physical plant, the actual classrooms themselves. So as I said a little bit earlier, Jeff and I and the whole WDI team, we do recognize these challenges faced by the accountancy department. And we have tried our best as we're putting together our recommended curriculum to think about these challenges and how they will impact your ability to design a new curriculum and implement that new curriculum that we're proposing. So as I said, our review process really started off with our two field visits. The more formal part of the curriculum review was to go through and use the curriculum re review framework that we first introduced to you in our draft report that was sent back in March of this year, and then also was presented by myself in, uh, in a presentation that I did on campus in March. 
So this curriculum review framework, just to reiterate what this was or what this is, is what we're trying to do is we're trying to think about what is the global way in which an accountancy curriculum can be delivered. So what are all the steps that need to go into teaching students what they need to know in order to be successful accountants. So of course the starting point or stage one of a curriculum framework is to create a comprehensive list of accountancy topics. What are all of those things that students should need to know if they're studying accounting? But the next stage is to take this global list of topics and translate it into specific courses. So sequencing the topics into specific courses and then of course sequencing those courses across the undergraduate program. That is, in what year and in what semester should a course be taken and what topics should be in that course. Once the course is put together, of course it needs to be delivered. It, we need to have effective faculty delivering the courses. Leading to now the course has been delivered, stage four, is we need to think about how our students being assessed in terms of their comprehensive um, comprehension and understanding of the material. Stage five, after the students have been assessed, how does this translate into grades? Once they've received their grades, what does this mean for them to be able to progress to the next course in the next sequence? And of course, ultimately, as they go through the program in stage six, they're finally awarded their accountancy degrees. So this is the framework that we've used to review the accountancy program, but it's also really the framework that we've used that's helped us sort of structure and think about how we're going to put our recommended curriculum together. So for the rest of the review is we're going to go stage by stage, talk about what it is, what's the analysis that we did, what things did we look at, what conclusions did we arrive from this analysis, and then of course how did these lead to our recommended curriculum. So for stage one, I'm going to turn over to Jeff to talk about creating the comprehensive list of topics. Jeff? Uh, thanks, Dennis, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so it's stage one again of the curriculum review. We're creating a comprehensive list of the topics that we think every accounting student should know in terms of financial accounting, management accounting, taxation, auditing, uh, accounting information systems. And so to create this list, we used three sources. First and uh, most obvious was to look at our own curriculum here at Michigan because we know we have a highly rated and, and highly respected accountancy program. But then second, we went to a list of topics that uh, was created by a uh, United Nations working group called the Intergovernmental Working Group of Experts on International Standards of Accounting and Reporting. And we've given you a, a reference link in our report uh, to the uh, work product of this group. Then we uh, looked finally at a cur the curriculum resources produced by the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants, the AICPA. And the AICPA worked with accounting educators to identify key competencies that they believe uh, that all accounting students should have. And the AICPA then focused its recommendations around these competencies. So in table one of the report uh, that uh, Dennis is uh, uh, displaying now, in table one we show how the various courses at Michigan meet these uh, competencies. So, so, yes, good. Thank you, Dennis. So the uh, competencies are divided into three basic uh, uh, groupings. The fun functional competencies, uh, of which there are six, followed by personal competencies. The, while the uh, first group, the functional competencies, dealt primarily with uh, the actual accounting knowledge that students need to gain, the personal competencies, of which there are seven, uh, focus on perhaps we would call more the, uh, the soft skills, the uh, problem solving and leadership and communication skills that, that successful accountants should have. And then the uh, third group uh, you see presented on the uh, uh, page in front of you, just broad business perspective competencies. 
outside of just the accounting rules themselves and GAAP, what else do well-rounded accounting students need to know? And uh, these competencies will come up again as we go through some of our recommendations, uh, as we go through them, especially the breadth uh, of courses, uh, we'll refer back to these various competencies. So using these three sources, our, our own curriculum here at Michigan, the ISAR uh, 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 information, as well as the AICPA framework, we've created a full list of topics, and we've documented where those topics are, are, are covered in the various courses taught at UL and here at Michigan. And also, we included one other school, the London School of Economics and Political Science, the LSE. So in table two of our report, we've provided uh, a comparison, uh, first for the financial accounting topics. That's in table 2A. Uh, then uh, we've done the same thing with the management accounting topics. They're in table 2B that you see. And then finally, the uh, auditing and accounting information systems topics are included in table 2C. And again, as you, as you have the opportunity to look through those tables, you'll see the various topics that we've identified that should be covered in all our curriculum. And then the specific courses that we offer here at the University of Michigan uh, to cover those topics. The courses that you presently offer at your university where the topics are addressed and then the courses offered by the LSE and uh, where the topics appear in their courses. Of, now, it should be noted that we did not do this for the area of tax, because when we looked at your tax syllabus uh, uh, for Accounting 409, it was very clear that what you teach is specific to the Liberia setting and your specific tax code. Uh, we didn't feel that there was any need to compare the Liberian tax topics with either the U.S. or the U.K. tax topics. So, uh, so we have not done a comparison of tax uh, topics here in Table 2. But that said, later on in our recommendations, we will come back and talk briefly about the tax courses again. So we've listed the topics. We did the comparisons. And what did we find? Well, we found that... Uh, UL teaches all of the topics that need to be taught in the accounting program. Uh, however, it does take considerably longer than uh, you take considerably longer than we do here either at U of M or at LSE to cover those same topics. And we're aware that the pace of t teaching is partially or, or fully a function of the constraints you currently face. But Going forward, in order to move up to having a program that meets international standards, this is something that will need to be addressed. And we discuss that more in our uh, findings. Uh, finally, another concern we have is with topic coverage. And here we're concerned about the depth of the coverage, I should say. The topics are all, all, all listed, but we're concerned as to the depth at which each specific topic is uh, covered in the in the actual classroom presentations. Uh, Dennis, perhaps here you'd like to uh, discuss this a bit more with an example of what you found. Yeah, uh, thanks Jeff. Um, this is something that came across in the, I, I sort of noticed it mostly in the management accounting, which was is my area of expertise. And when I was looking at the three syllabi, the syllabi for the three courses that you have, accounting 309, 310, and 314, I see the topics are all there but I just see them coming up once. And if I compare these to what we do at Michigan where we have two courses, Accounting 301 and Accounting 315, we have the topics, but we tend to repeat them because what we do at Michigan in our introductory course, we tend to introduce the students to the mechanics. Here's how you do variance analysis. Here's how you put together a budget. Here's how you calculate break-even. It focuses on the mechanics, whereas in our intermediate course, it's, which is geared much more towards accountants, so the first course all business students must take, the intermediate course, which is geared towards accountants, 
talks about the same tools, but it takes the assumption the the mechanics are already known, and it really moves up a level and says, if you're going to be an accountant, you're going to need to be able to design, implement, and use these tools in practice. So how do we do that? It's not just about can you calculate a variance, it's the how would you put the system together, why would you use it, how would you use it, what would you use the results for? And so from reviewing the syllabi at UL, it wasn't clear to me that there was enough time to really allow you to get into that sort of depth. So it's something we have a concern about and it's, it's something that we've tried to address in our recommendations when we put together our sample syllabi for your courses. We have put in there room to go into the depth to talk about, to, to go deeper and talk about, you know, in the management accounting area, how would you design, implement, and use management accounting tools. So it's one thing that really came out of this first stage. But as Jeff was talking about, the stage one is getting this comprehensive list of topics. We've done this. We see that you teach all of these topics. The next step is to really take these into where these topics appear, which courses do they appear in, in which and which year, which semester, so I should say what semester, what year of the program. So the next thing that we looked at is take the global list that we had in stage one, let's look at which courses are, which are taught in which, uh, which courses. So a lot of that does come from the table two that we sh that's in our report that were just on the screen a few minutes ago. But what we really wanted to do was we wanted to look at how are courses sequenced at the three institutions, University of Michigan, University of Liberia, and the London School of Economics. So in table three, which I'm going to put up here on the screen, let me get this up here. In table three, and I apologize, this one's a little bit harder to read. To get everything on one table, we had to make the font a little bit small. Um, what we tried to put in here is across the four years of the program, where are the specific courses being taught? Some of the things that you'll notice from this table are, first, at University of Michigan, we don't start teaching our students any accounting courses in their freshman year. They're not actually admitted into the business school until their sophomore year, so they do not take any accounting courses in that freshman year. Also, in this table for the University of Michigan, we've included a graduate year, semester one and semester two. This is because to, be an, to become a CPA in the U.S., the AICPA requires 150 credit hours. So this means most of our accounting students will stay at Michigan for their fifth year, the graduate year, where they study for their Master's of Accounting degree. You should also notice that the LSE is a three-year program, a typical British program. So it's a three-year program. There is no senior year, so we've not included any courses in that year. The main thing we notice from looking at Table 3, as we did in Stage 1, is that UL has significantly, many more, or significantly more accounting courses relative to U of M and LSE. And nothing else to add here. We notice that in Stage 1. It's also obvious when we look at it here. The next thing that we did is we've taken the global list of topics, we've taken the sequencing of specific courses, and then we really asked ourselves, well, when should these topics be taught? Which course, which semester, which year? So we've only done this for U of M in our table four, and what we've done here is we've taken the specific topics and said, here's the course they should be in. So because we believe we have a, 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 a top, well, we know we have a top-rated program at Michigan, we've said, well, what is it that we do at Michigan? Let's create these for the financial accounting and the management accounting courses, and then we can use this table for our recommendations for UL. So we know UL is already teaching all the topics. We know that you're doing it in more, more courses than we're doing. So we've said, if we get, when we get to our recommendations, can we take what we do and sort of pass it on to you so you can adopt that as well. So if we go into table four, so table 4A, let me bring that one up. There it is. In table 4A, we've, for example, in our first um, financial accounting course, Accounting 300, we've listed out all of the topics that are taught in that particular class. 
just rather than you know in our in in stage one we just have a global list of topics here we're actually taking those topics and putting them into specific courses we've done this in table 4a this is only one of the pages it it goes on and because there's so many topics we've also done table 4b let me bring that one up which is the managerial accounting topics again all that's shown here on the screen is the topics that are taught in our first introductory managerial accounting course, Accounting 301. As I said earlier, we've not, re we've not replicated this for U of L because all we're really doing is taking the topics from our syllabi. We've already listed out all of your topics in your syllabi in our, in our first analyses in Table 2 and your courses in Table 3. We've included Table 4 here because we are going to be using this as a basis to take us forward to our recommendations, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. So in terms of sequencing of courses and topics, as, as we've said, UL has many more accounting courses. We're aware of that, so what we're trying to do is to take from Michigan our topics in the courses that they're taught, that is tables 4A and 4B for financial and management accounting respectively, we're going to use that as a basis for our topic sequencing in our recommendations. So going through the stages of curriculum development, stage one was creating the global list of topics, stage two was sequencing those topics. Once the courses are put together, the next thing is we need to have these courses delivered. And we believe that there are three aspects related to course delivery. The first of these is individual faculty teaching. And this box here really relates to how effective is each faculty member, individual faculty member, in delivering or teaching his or her course. So as part of the bigger WDI project, we have provided a great deal related to trying to improve the, the effectiveness of individual faculty teaching under Deliverable 3. That is, we've had teaching workshops led by Professor Bird in Ann Arbor, both in um, last, uh, last fall and again in April when faculty visited. I also gave a workshop when I visited um, Liberia in March. As well, we've also last week sent to you a teaching practice manual um, to, as I said, help with improving the effectiveness of individual faculty teaching. The second aspect of course delivery are the teaching methods that are being used. So in the workshops delivered by Professor Bird and myself and in the teaching practice manual, we do discuss a number of different methods that can be used for effective teaching. These include such things as traditional and interactive lectures, bringing in outside speakers, potentially using simulations, having group work and group presentations. I know in one of the classes I sat through, I think it was an accounting 003 class, there was a group presentation, so I know it's something that UL is already doing, and potentially maybe using uh, cases. While I was there in Liberia, I did present a um, seminar on uh, writing cases and teaching cases. So this doesn't really relate to the cur curriculum itself, it's just what we're trying to do is include it in here to help you think about not only becoming, improving the effectiveness of teaching, but bringing in different teaching methods to, to help improve the, the learning capabilities of the students. The third aspect of our course delivery is the coordination across multiple sections. And I think this one's a little bit of a, a red flag or a red herring for us. We do know for some of your courses, you have multiple sections, 10, 20, 30 sections of the same course with a lot of different faculty teaching the same course. This means there needs to be coordination across the multiple sections to ensure that all faculty are teaching the same thing in the same class. From our discussions with you, it is our understanding that you have coordination meetings between the fa amongst or the faculty get together in coordination meetings before the semester begins to discuss the syllabus, and then there generally tends to be a meeting before the midterm 
and the final exam in order to discuss the topics that have been taught so that the exams can be set. I know when I was in Liberia, I did talk with some faculty who said there have been some cases where you try to have more frequent meetings, but it, to us it's not 100% clear how effective that is, how, how, you, how often you actually seem to have regular meetings. The lack of these coordination meetings does give us some concerns. From talking with you, from reviewing the exams, which we're going to talk about in a moment, it seems that not all faculty are teaching all of the topics. This means that not all of the topics are being examined, so your exams are not comprehensive. This leads to students potentially and most likely having gaps in their knowledge. This to us is, is a big issue. We'll talk about this more when we get to our recommendations, but we can't stress enough how important it is to ensure that all the topics are being taught so that when students go from one year to the next, they don't have these gaps, they can quickly move on to the next level of course. So as we go through the framework, first we created a global list of topics. We then had to sequence these into courses. We then talk, we've now talked about how these courses are delivered. Stage four moves us to the assessment of, uh, assessment of student performance. So I'm going to turn over to Jeff to talk about what it is we did to look at uh, student performance. Thank you, Dennis. So as we approach the uh, uh, assessment of the performance, we looked at the exams that we were provided. Uh, we received copies of midterm exams and final exams for most every course. There were a few courses where we received only the final exams. I believe there were two courses where we had no exams to work from. But we looked at the uh, exams and compared them more or less side by side with the various topics that were supposed to be covered in each course based upon the descriptions in the syllabi. So we're displaying, uh, we'll display a couple of these for, for you to uh, see. This uh, is taken from Table 5 in our report. Uh, let's look at Accounting 201 there, Principles of Accounting 1. We've listed all of the uh, topics, I believe there are 16 of them there. 16 topics that are shown on the syllabus as being topics that will be covered over the course of the semester. Yet when we looked at the midterm exam and the final exam for, for that uh, semester, we saw that only six of the 16 topics were specifically tested, clearly tested on the exam. The other 10 topics were not included on the exam. So uh, you know, just over 60% of the, of the uh, topics were not examined. Uh, on the final exam for Accounting 201. Uh, let's see, I think we have another example, Accounting 309. Is that available? Yeah, Jeff, I'm, oh, okay. I went over it. I'm going <laughs> to get back to it. I apologize. <laughs> no, there no, it is. no Sorry. problem. Okay, good. Thank you. Yeah, so here's Accounting 309. Uh, once again, there are 15 topics that are listed on the syllabus as material that will be uh, covered during the semester. When we looked at the midterm and the final exams, uh, 10 of the topics were clearly tested on the exams, but five were not. So a third of the topics did not get included on the exams. So that's a concern. Now, uh, again, we're aware of the fact that uh, we can only review the exams provided to us. And uh, we're also aware that there are other means of methods of assessing uh, specific topics. Uh, Dennis mentioned the student presentations that he witnessed in Accounting 003. Uh, so we're aware that there are other ways that you can go about assessing the, the uh, uh, performance of students, but uh, related to our discussion that we just had, had about coordination among sections, it does appear that not all topics are examined. And this may be due to the fact that just not all the topics are being covered in all sections. So that's a concern. Are all the topics that are listed on the syllabus actually being covered in class 
and tested on the exams. Uh, the second area that we reviewed and uh, related to assessment of performance had to do with the level of difficulty of the exams themselves, the rigor of the exams. And as we went through the exams that we received, we generally saw that the questions were true-false questions or multiple-choice questions or short answer, uh, short calculation questions. And they seem to be very straightforward. And we think there's some room there to increase the level of difficulty of the exams. Now, we're, we are aware, again, of the constraints that you're uh, currently facing. Uh, but as you go forward and look to improve uh, uh, your program, one issue that needs to be addressed is the, the level of rigor of the exams. And so as we uh, move to our recommendations in a few minutes, you'll see that we do have some specific recommendations related to the exams themselves. Uh, Dennis, why don't I turn it over to you to, to cover stage five. Okay. So just getting towards the end of the curriculum framework, the next stage is once there's been an assessment of student performance, we need to think about how does that translate into grades and how does that then allow students to progress to subsequent courses. Excuse me. So. We've, we looked at a few things here about grading and student progression. The first one we looked at was how do we, what's the assessment weights? How are the different components of assessment weighted to, uh, to arrive at the final grade? So it's our understanding that the accountancy departments or the accounting department is currently using 15% for class participation, 20% for the midterm, and 65% for the final exam. Now put an arrow there hitting towards the final exam, the weight of 65%. This sort of raised our eyebrows a little bit here because this seems to be an awful large weight on the final exam. One of the issues that we have is if not all topics are being covered and therefore not on the exam, and if this tends to show up at the end of the course, this is going to show up on the final exam, so it's a fairly large weight to be dedicated to just a few topics. Another issue with this is if it's the case that not all of your exams, final exams are cumulative, so if you, you just the final exams are just examining what's been taught since the midterm, again this gives a fairly large weight towards the, um, to, towards the final topics in the course. So it's one of the things we're going to talk about in our recommendations uh, when, uh, in a few minutes. The second element that we looked at regarding grades and student progression was the policy that the accounting department's using for converting weighted grades into letter grades. Now, it's our understanding that current, the current policy that's being used, and, and this is a recently a new policy, is that the students will receive a letter grade of A for 76 to 100 percent, a letter grade of B for 66 to 75 percent, and so on, so listed here in the current column. We're quite happy with this. We, when I first saw that, when Jeff and I first saw that, we were quite excited about this. It is a fairly rigorous policy. It's fairly stringent. Um, and we both commented on how it doesn't seem to have suffered from as much grade inflation that we have here, that we have witnessed in North America. So we were quite happy with this policy. That said, from talking to faculty when I was there in March and from reviewing older syllabi, it appears that the previous policy used by the, accountancy depart the accounting department and my understanding is that this was the business college policy, is that a letter grade of A would go for 90 to 100 percent, B for 80 to 89 percent, and so on, so listed there in the previous column. So we have seen that you have changed your policy. We still think it's, it's good and it's stringent, but we would caution you from making it, you know, making it even more favorable as you go forward. As you put in new curriculum, as you start to use more rigorous exams, we don't want to see that being countered by having great inflation and, and awarding grades for, for lower percentages. So it's just one thing that we wanted to comment on there. And the final thing that we looked at for student progression was how do students progress to subsequent courses. Now we couldn't find any formal policy in the documents that we reviewed what we do see on the majority of the course syllabi that we reviewed is that there is a requirement of a, a, 
of achieving a letter grade of C or above in the prerequisite course. Um, and this we're quite happy with. We believe that this keeps up standards, so it's something we'd encourage you to continue doing. So this brings us now to our final stage in the curriculum frame, developing curriculum framework is the, the awarding of accountancy degrees. The only policy that we're aware of is the one that we found in the document which is titled Know Your College, College of Business and Public Administration Curriculum Guide. So this is the document that goes through and lists out the different uh, programs that you have within the business college and lists out the majority of your courses. In this document we found, and I've replicated it here, what are the requirements in terms of credit hours and subject areas that students need to take to be awarded an accountancy degree. When we compare this to the policy that we have at, at Michigan, we have something very similar. We list the credit hours by how many liberal arts courses are needed, how many business school courses are needed, how many accountancy courses are needed, so those types of things. So we're very similar. The only thing that we noted that was different between our two policies is that at Michigan we have a minimum GPA requirement. So we have a minimum GPA requirement to remain in the program, so to keep students in good standing, and then also there is a minimum GPA requirement to be awarded the degree. We're not sure if U of L has the same thing. We couldn't find one. If not, we would encourage you, of course, within the overall framework of the rules of the the bigger of you know of the university, to institute a a minimum GPA. Maybe if, if you can't for awarding of the degrees due to U of L regulations, at least maybe for to remain in good standing in the program. So this gets us to the end of our review, and I just wanted to spend a few moments here going through and reviewing our main findings because these will really influence what our recommendations are going to be. So our main findings are first, as I started off with, we are fully aware and recognize that the UL accounting, the accounting department faces a number of challenges. You have a large number of students who may not all be fully committed to be accounting students. You don't have enough fully committed faculty. You have a lot of part-time faculty, some of who may not be fully dedicated and committed to, to their teaching um, commitments. And finally, you have a lack of resources with respect to teaching materials, textbooks, audiovisual equipment, physical plants, etc. As I started in the introduction of this presentation, you know, we keep bringing these up. We're aware of these. We fully understand how they impact your ability to deliver a high-quality program. We've got some suggestions in our recommendations that we think can help you start to address these and help you move towards a higher-quality program. We reckon, we notice that U of L has significantly many more accountant, accountancy courses than both the University of Michigan and the London School of Economics. We believe that not all topics are being taught in all sections, and this means not all topics are being examined, which leads to the possibility of potential situation in which not all students are in a situation that students may have gaps in their knowledge. However, from talking and working with you, we are fully aware that there are a number of full and I should have put part-time faculty here as well. There are a number of full and part-time faculty and senior management that are highly dedicated to the accountancy program and fully support changes to make improvements to it. So given your level of enthusiasm and commitment, we are now excited to turn over to the next part of our presentation, which are our recommendations. So as I just said, let's talk about our recommendations for the revised curriculum for the undergraduate accountancy program. To summarize our recommendations, we have primary recommend we have our primary recommendation and we split this into two parts, short term and long term. In the short term, we believe that you should adopt the revised curriculum guide that has been prepared by the accounting departments. However, in the longer term, 
we believe that you need to implement a new advanced curriculum which will bring you in line with international education standards. We'll talk more about the primary recommendation, both short-term and long-term, in just a moment. In addition to our primary recommendation, we also have five minor recommendations which we've included for, and they are there to address specific issues that arose from our review of the current undergraduate accountancy curriculum. But let me turn back to the primary recommendation and in the short term. In the short term, we recommend that the accountancy department implements their proposed curriculum guide as outlined in the draft revised curriculum guide. We do believe that this curriculum should only be used in the short term. That is, in a, in, for the next one to three years. Since we're recommending in the short term that the, the curriculum you use is the proposed curriculum guide already developed by the accountancy department, we have not provided a lot of the specific details of course content for the accounting courses in our report. We've not done this because most of the accounting courses in your recommended curriculum, your proposed curriculum guide, are courses that are already being taught. However, we have noticed there are two exceptions, one financial accounting course and one managerial accounting course. So let me bring this up. First is the removal of accounting 003. So this is getting rid of that introductory, that very first financial accounting course. And this then sort of leads the question as to what is going to be taught in the remaining accounting courses, particularly the, uh, the financial accounting courses, in particular the early ones, Accounting 101, Accounting 102, and Accounting 103. So we have provided course descriptions, course topics, and sample syllabi for those first three financial accounting courses. These can be found in Table 6 and for the course descriptions and course topics, and in Appendix A for the sample syllabi. When I refer to tables here, I'm referring to Deliverable 1. They're also in Deliverable 2, but in different tables, but I'll just refer to Deliverable 1 here. The other noticeable thing that we notice that's changing from what's currently done to the proposed revised curriculum guide is the removal of Accounting 314. Um, this now only leaves the two management accounting courses, Accounting 309, Accounting 310. Since we're not sure, like with the financial accounting courses, if you've developed your own, you know, your, your new syllabi for these courses, we have provided course descriptions, course topics, and sample syllabi for the two management accounting courses. Again, Table 6 and Appendix 1. Our recommendation is that you use the proposed um, draft revised curriculum guide in the short term, say one to three years. We put this time period on it because of a number of reasons. One, um, we think you need time to start to address the challenges that you face, and I'm going to turn to some of our thoughts on how you can do that. Number two, we're aware that the President of Liberia has recently put together a plan for improving the education in Liberia. And we understand that this is more likely at the you know, elementary, middle school, and high school levels, but hopefully we'll start to come into play into the students that you get into the accounting program. And also from discussions that I had with a lot of you when I was there in Liberia, you kept talking about having those diamonds, getting those diamonds in the classroom, you know, the high caliber students. And most of you have seen like that was a couple of years away, so this period of one to three years. So when we were thinking about putting this together, it really came up to this three-year period. But back to my first point. In this short-term period, we do recommend that you address the current constraints or challenges that you're facing, um, that you're currently facing. The first of these are the number of students that you have. We believe that you should reduce the number of students that you have studying accountancy. And I know um, Alex and I had a long discussion about this when I was there in Liberia. I know we discussed this when the faculty came out in April. We believe the number of students should be restricted. That means you should be selective. You should have some admission criteria. We'll talk about what we think that is going to be because this is going to play into 
our long-term solution. Regarding the faculty, we believe that you need to do two things here. One, you need to work on faculty development. And we've already delivered some workshops that you can take and re-deliver yourself. You now have the teaching practice manual. This should help to ensure that we bring you're able to bring up the, the effectiveness of all of the faculty. We also are going to recommend in our minor recommendations for more formal faculty evaluation. So we'll talk about that in a moment. And the final constraint are resources. And there are really two areas that, we can, that we've got some suggestions here in terms of relating to the classroom materials. First thing is um, having access to textbooks. So deliverables four and six of the, of the project are to talk about accessing, having access to teaching materials and um, provi uh, providing advice on how to get access to teaching materials and providing advice on how to improve your student reference Liberia. So coming later in the year, we'll be providing some more um, material for you in terms of how to do that. The other thing, and we'll talk about this in our minor recommendations, is the developing your own material. So I'll save that one for our minor recommendations. To, to summarize here, in the short, top, short term, we're recommending that you adopt your proposed draft revised curriculum guide or your revised curriculum guide However, in the long term, we are recommending that you, the accountancy department implement a revised curriculum. And this is going to be more advanced, which has two tracks of accountancy students. We've talked about moving to being selective and having admission criteria. We'll talk about the criteria a little bit later on. But for those students that meet the admission criteria, they will be admitted to the professional track. Students who do not meet the admission guidelines, do not meet the criteria, who still want to study accountancy will be admitted to the general track. And I'm going to talk about the two tracks a little bit more in a second. But we, we believe that the department, the accountancy department, should aim to introduce this revised curriculum in the period of three to five years from now. Now regarding these two tracks, when we were putting this together and when we were discussing this, we were unsure as to say, let's, let's recommend that you just move to a program that just has the professional track, that just has the high caliber students. And two things really came up to, our, to us that said, no, we don't think that's the best recommendation, and here they are. First is we're fully aware that U of L, the University of Liberia, is a public institution that has a mandate to educate the citizens of Liberia. So we believe that there may be some political pressure if you come out and say, we're not going to let everyone who wants to study accounting study accounting. So we're a little bit worried that there may be some political backlash if you restrict your program to, you restrict the program to, to not all the students that want to take it. But the other thing that we were really thinking here is that, you know, we believe that there is a need in Liberia for more of general accountants. I guess I would use the term bookkeepers. We believe that there's this need in the Liberian economy. And we think that those students that are pursuing the general track would be able to fulfill more of those roles. So the professional track is more of what we would think of as the CPAs. The general track would move into the more general, I use the word bookkeeper type role. So we have recommended the two tracks, and we will talk about the admission criteria in a little bit. Now, here's the key features of our proposed curriculum. The first one is that we are recommending only eight accounting courses, three financial accounting courses, two management accounting courses, and then one accounting information systems course, one auditing course, and one taxation course. We're recommending that you introduce more breadth courses. So these breadth courses are courses that will start to address and ensure that all students have 
and have all of the competencies that are outlined by the AICPA. This was our table one. This is what Jeff was talking about when we were talking in or when we were discussing stage one of the curriculum framework. And finally, we're going to recommend that you add in some accounting electives. Two accounting electives for the general track students and four accounting electives for the professional track. So these are the key features. We are going to talk about all of these elements as we, starting now, as we go through year by year of the program. So here's the specific details. This is table seven. I, what I want to do is go through year by year and semester by semester. I'm not going to talk about every course. I'm just going to sort of highlight the changes that we've made relative to the draft or the revised curriculum guide that the, the, that the accountancy department has put together, the one that we're recommending you use in the short term. So what you'll see in the freshman year is that for the most part, students, or for the most part, for the full part, students will continue to take the same non-accounting courses. For example, economics, French, English, etc. As in the short, as in the curriculum that we're recommending for the short term. What has changed are the two accounting courses. In the first semester, we're recommending Accounting 101, Principles of Financial Accounting, and Accounting 151 in the second semester, which is Principles of Management Accounting. So all of these courses we have provided, for the accounting courses, we have provided course descriptions, course topics, and sample syllabi. These are provided in Deliverable 1, these are provided in Table 8 for the course descriptions and course topics, and Appendix B for the sample syllabi. So we're not going to go into the specifics of each individual course here. If we, if we want, if there are questions, we can talk about those at the end of the presentation or do this offline as well. Um, but we have, as I said, provided those course descriptions, course topics, and sample syllabi for all of the accounting courses. As we move to the sophomore year, um, things are similar to the freshman year for all of the non-accounting courses. So all that's really changing here is the two accounting courses. In the first semester is Accounting 201, Intermediate Financial Accounting. In the second semester, Accounting 251, Intermediate Management Accounting. So where things really start to take a change is in the junior year. So in the first semester of the junior year, we've got Accounting 303, Accounting Information Systems. In the second semester, we have Accounting 305, Principles of Auditing, Accounting 309, Principles of Taxation. But the big thing you're going to notice here is FIN 411 in the first semester, FIN 412 in the second semester, Principles of Finance 1, Principles of Finance 2, respectively. Now, in the re proposed revised curriculum guide that the accountancy department put together, we noticed these courses in the senior year. We also noticed that, the, that it, a note that was saying these are new courses that you're going to be approaching the finance department to put together. We're working on the assumption that these courses do exist and will exist when you put in the new curriculum. What we put here, though, which is different, we have put these in the junior year. Now we know they're 400 level classes, so I don't know what the administrative details are, whether a 400 level class can be taken in the junior year or not. If not, maybe we change the numbers because we fundamentally believe that finance should be taught earlier in the program for two reasons. Reason one, we think a lot of the concepts in finance are going to be needed when you get to the advanced financial accounting course that we have in the senior year start to deal with a lot more time value of money type things, for example. And we believe that they, these, are the, these topics are going to be important for some of the electives. For example, the financial statement analysis course. I should have said three. I said two reasons. There are actually three reasons. The third reason is we're also going to recommend in the senior year that students have more access to more business school electives and students may want to take more finance courses. We know at Michigan a lot of our accounting students take an awful lot of finance courses as well. So we believe these finance courses need to be moved up. 
Okay, senior year. Oh, sorry, one other thing that I need to talk about in the junior year. It's the last line that you'll notice in the second semester. It says breadth one. So I said we're going to introduce these breadth courses. I'm going to jump ahead two slides. We introduced breadth courses to ensure that students are meeting the or developing their competencies as outlined by the AC, AICPA. This again is table one, and Jeff talked about this in stage one of the curriculum. Some of those competencies are included in things like economics, statistics, law, and finance, which are already included in the program. What we wanted added in are the first three primarily, which are organizational behavior, marketing management, and operations management. Rather than develop new courses, we have looked at the curriculum guides for the College of Business, and they seem to these courses, Management 301, Management 314, and Management 407, seem to be the courses that cover these topics. We haven't reviewed the actual syllabi, but we have reviewed the course descriptions. So we believe those need to be added in. These are where we include breadth one, breadth two, breadth three. We do not have a recommendation as to when students take them. This is something you can put in, or you can allow students to take it whenever they, you know, whenever they want it in the in the junior and senior year. The other breadth course that we have on this slide is the Management 430 Business College Policy and Strategy. I'm going to come back and talk about that when I, as I'm talking about the senior year. So here in the senior year, what we have is Accounting 401, Advanced Financial Accounting in the first semester. For the general students, we have also included IMIS 306, Management Information Systems 2. This is the course that seems to, you know, focus on accounting programs, uh, uh, software packages that leads more to the general type of accountant, i.e. the bookkeepers. So in this first semester we also have breadth, the second breadth, we have two accounting electives for the professional students, none for the general students, but we'll come in and talk about those, um, I'll talk about the accounting electives in a second. Excuse me. Um, and we've also included business school electives. We do think it's important for students, to, in addition to their minors, develop their knowledge of other things that they're interested in in the business school. Now, we're not fully wed to that these need to be business school electives. Maybe these are liberal arts electives. Students can go out and, or even science electives, go out and develop their knowledge in other areas to be a well-rounded student. Okay. Finally, the second semester, we have the third breadth course. We have two accounting electives for the general students and two for the professional students. We also have this Management 430 Business Policy and Strategy. We believe that all business school students should take a course in their senior year. Here we've got it in the second semester. that serves as a capstone course. And what I mean by that is it's a course that should address or discuss business problems and issues as a whole, and it should draw on knowledge from across the functional areas. It shouldn't just be how do you solve an accounting problem, how do you solve a marketing problem, etc. It should be a capstone, it should be summarizing and, and drawing on students' knowledge of all the functional areas. From our review of the curriculum, uh, UL's curriculum guide in the business college, it appears that Management 430, Business Policy and Strategy, is exactly this course to do that. So there you have it. That's our proposed curriculum guides. Um, I've talked about the breadth courses. We haven't yet talked about the electives. So in Table 9, we provide course descriptions and course topics for six electives um, that we believe should be adopted. Um, these are briefly oil and gas accounting and we've always talked about this ever since day one that we've been working with you that given the dependence of the Liberian economy on natural resources this course really needs to be in there. The other ones we've added are an advanced management accounting course a taxation and managerial decisions course, a financial statement analysis course. Because a number of students 
from UL tend to go work in the government. We fully believe, fundamentally believe that a governmental accounting course needs to be included. And finally, a course on advanced auditing. Now for brevity, I just I don't want to go into the details of each of these courses and here's what they'll cover. As I said, Table 9 includes the course descriptions and course topics that we believe should be included in each of these courses. Two final things that I want to address uh, about the curriculum that we propose. One, we need to go back because we've said that we believe you should have two tracks, the professional and the general track is the issue of selection criteria. Our recommendation for selection criteria is that students apply at the end of their freshman year and so they uh, apply and they are assessed based on their grades, their GPA from their freshman year and that they should also write a brief essay discussing why they want to be admitted to the professional track. Based on this, the accounting department can make its selection of students. We do not have a recommended size, uh, pro, uh, the size of the program. That is the number of students that should be admitted to the professional track. This is something that you'll need to think about and a few things we believe would come into this decision. First is, you know, job opportunities for these students. So really, where can these students go? What's the need for students that are more professionally trained, more of a CPA route versus those that would go more into a general accounting type role. The second issue, of course, is the number of, uh, of students you could handle on the professional track. And we think this is a function of the number of faculty that you could, that you could staff. So how many effective faculty do you have that are going to teach um, at a high caliber level? take the number of faculty, multiply by the number of sections they can teach, multiply by the number of students per section, this should give you a rough idea of the number of students that you could have in the program. So that's the one issue. The other issue, and you'll see this as we go through the curriculum, and I'm just going to back up here for a second, is in the sophomore year you see that we have Accounting 201, Accounting 251 in the first and second semesters. In the junior year, in the first semester, we have Accounting 303, second semester we have Accounting 305, Accounting 309, and so on. So both the general and professional track students are taking the same accounting courses, but we are recommending that they have different sections. So there's a section only for the general students take, there are sections that professional students take. In our course descriptions, course topics, and sample syllabi, we are suggesting or recommending that these courses ha have the same topics. So what's going to differ between the two? Well, we believe given the higher caliber students in the professional track, they can be taught at a faster pace. So they'll be getting the same topics, but to help them further develop their knowledge, they're going to be doing other things. So they may be doing things like case studies, they may be doing group projects, they may be doing research reports, things that are helping them get an even deeper understanding of the specific topics. I think the analogy here is the honors program, your section 001s. It's my understanding or our understanding that the 001 students are supposed to have a research focus to the classes and we think that should translate over into the professional track as well. So that's it for our that's it for our primary recommendation. I'm going to turn over to Jeff now who's going to take us through the remainder of the presentation which is which are our minor recommendations. Jeff? Great, thank you Dennis. Uh, so in our report in addition to the primary recommendation, the major recommendation, we've identified five minor recommendations that you see displayed here. Now these are minor in the sense that we believe they can be easily uh, implemented. Most of them uh, could be implemented at the departmental level without uh, needing any action by the faculty senate. Uh, but while we've labeled them minor, they are far from unimportant. We believe that the implementation of these recommendations will result in market improvements in student knowledge in a, in a very short period of time. So we've identified five of them. 
regarding the development of teaching materials, evaluation of faculty, coordination across multiple sections, rigor of exams, and the weighting scheme. Topics that we've all uh, that have all been uh, touched on earlier as we uh, discussed our, our review. Looking at them one at a time, on the uh, uh, the issue of developing uh, teaching materials, uh, there's a problem: access to textbooks. And we believe that a one uh, a solution, at least on the short term, would be to uh, develop uh, uh, pamphlets, uh, course materials. We know they're used in the economics department, and we believe the the accounting department used to prepare these. Uh, Dennis often uses his own lecture notes, and we provided a, a sample of one of his lecture notes in Appendix C to the report. Uh, it's our understanding that Alex has used his own material in his auditing course, and Richard uses uh, his own material in his tax course. Well, we encourage and recommend that uh, other faculty develop their own material. Uh, so, in addition to textbook type material, we also recommend that you become more active in developing uh, additional materials such as cases and other uh, materials for group projects and research reports and the like. In Appendix F to our report, uh, Dennis has provided a copy of a, a, a material that he used for his case development and teaching workshop that he presented to you uh, back in the springtime. So, we'd encourage you to work towards developing cases. Develop them and then share them with, with uh, one another. Uh, in development, or rather in deliverable three of the larger project, we have delivered four workshops on teacher development. And you've also received the ter uh, teaching practice manual from uh, Professor Bird. More on that in just a second. But with, so that's deliverable three. And in deliverables four and six, uh, we'll be working there to provide advice on accessing additional teaching materials and textbooks. So that's uh, to be uh, worked on later uh, this year, the project. So developing teaching materials, we'd encourage you to work in, uh, to develop your own in-house materials uh, as a short-term uh, solution. Moving to the next uh, recommendation. Uh, I'll be uh, making reference quite often to the teaching manual again that Professor Bird sent you. So when we're thinking about evaluation of faculty, uh, Professor Bird has provided you some material that is, is excellent. Uh, those of you who have visited us in Ann Arbor this year know Professor Bird. Uh, but for the rest of you, uh, Karen Bird is one of the pedagogy specialists that we have here at the Ross School of Business. And so in addition to teaching accounting courses at the principal's level, she's also the director of teacher development uh, for our graduate instructors. In fact, she spent all of last week and she's spending this week working with our PhD students who will be teaching at Ross this year. So uh, she has conducted workshops for uh, faculty that's visited with us. Those materials are available. Uh, and that is in the teaching practice manual. If I move ahead to, the to uh, again, the, the uh, slide 28 on the evaluation of faculty, uh, we know that you're considering course evaluation. So Richard mentioned this, uh, this to Dennis uh, when Dennis was visiting back in March. And we strongly believe that these evaluations should be used. Uh, they should be done in one of the last two or three classes. Uh, they should be collected by a student not the fac a faculty member, but not the faculty member, collected by a student and returned directly to the accounting department. In our report, we provided some sample questions you might consider using. And Professor Bird's teaching manual would also prove useful here, as the final resource in her manual provides more information about designing a system for course evaluations. So we believe course evaluations should be implemented as soon as possible as a way to assist you in evaluating the performance of your, your uh, faculty members. Also under uh, evaluation of faculty, we believe that there should be regular classroom observations. We think a senior faculty member should observe at least 
one class delivered by all faculty for a more formal evaluation and of course this would be an unannounced uh, observation. So once again that final resource in Professor Bird's teaching manual pro uh, will prove helpful as it provides a set of guidelines for observing instructors and providing feedback to them. So we believe that every faculty member should be uh, observed at least once a semester and perhaps for new instructors or the part-time instructors, uh, a more uh, frequent observation, uh, more, something more than just once a semester might be appropriate. Now, we don't have any uh, recommendations as to what to do for underperformance, as that's pretty much outside the scope of our project. But nevertheless, working within the framework of Liberian labor law and your university's uh, human resource policies, we believe that that it's appropriate to develop some requirement, minimum requirements, and a system to use to deal with those students, or rather those faculty members, part-time faculty members who aren't performing at an acceptable level. So course evaluations is the major, and ob classroom observations are the major recommendations when it comes to evaluation of faculty. Excuse me. Moving on to the uh, next minor recommendation, coordination across multiple sections. We've mentioned this several times as being matters of concern, that topics, uh, while the uh, a course might be well designed, the actual delivery of material uh, might fall short due to a lack of coordination across multiple sections. So we highly recommend that in addition to any uh, meetings prior to the start of the semester or just before the uh, exams, we recommend that there are weekly meetings throughout the term. And the focus of the meetings will be on the specific topics to be taught and the methods to be used to teach those topics during the upcoming week. And this should ensure that all the faculty are keeping pace at the same time that all topics are going to be taught and thus all topics will be tested. And it's going to be critical that instructors come to these meetings fully prepared, having reviewed the material to be covered in any assignments, because this has the added benefit of allowing the faculty to share their resources and their best practices, which should be translated into a better learning experience for your students. And we can't stress enough that attendance at these meetings is mandatory. You fundamentally need to address the fact that different faculty are teaching different amounts of, of the syllabus and this cannot continue. Now, well, once again, I'll refer you to the resources in Professor Bird's teaching manual there at the end. They should prove, prove helpful as they provide suggestions as to how to design and implement a program coordinating instruction over multiple sections of a course. So that third minor uh, recommendation again, how to better coordinate across sections. We say please establish weekly coordination meetings where instructors can discuss among themselves topics to be taught, methods to be used, and share what works well and perhaps what didn't work as well. The fourth minor recommendation uh, has to do with the rigor of, of the exams. From our review of the current exams, we don't believe that the exam, or well, we believe they could be made uh, uh, tougher. Uh, of course, as you move towards having a higher caliber student, then it should be a natural progression to have more rigorous exams. And one element of this is to make the types of questions more difficult. Uh, but we'd also recommend not just uh, uh, moving away from multiple choice, true, false, exclusively, but do include some longer calculation questions, some essay questions. We have provided in Appendix D to our report some sample midterm exams and final exams for our two introductory and intermediate financial accounting courses and management accounting courses. I strongly encourage you to, to look through those, all of those exams even if they don't pertain to a course that you teach. Please look through them to get a feel for the uh, other ways you might go about designing exams 
to test your students. And again, Professor Bird's provided some useful material on best practices when it comes to designing and grading exams in her teaching manual, so I can't stress enough. Use that manual. It's a very useful tool. Uh, finally, final recommendation has to do with the weighting scheme for individual assessment elements. Uh, we believe there should be some flexibility allowed depending on the sp specific course. So, of course, multiple sections of the same course should be using the same weights, but we believe it's important to have a significant weight based, up, based upon uh, participation quizzes in class assessments, say 20 to 40 percent, then the midterm exam and the final exam perhaps be equally weighted between 30 and 40 percent of the uh, total points. Uh, uh, if you wanted to stress the final exam a bit more, the midterm exam a bit less, that would be acceptable, but please, please, please uh, make class participation and active learning a major portion of the student's learning experience and thus a major portion of your uh, assessment process. Uh, so as far as measuring class participation, it's our understanding that uh, Right now, participation pretty much seems to be assessed based on attendance and uh, using a sign-up sheet every class. We'd encourage you to move beyond that. Come up with, with uh, uh, caselets and, and uh, uh, group projects and things that call for more discussion in class as a way to increase the active participation of the students. Uh, I, those are our minor recommendations. Again, I believe that every one of those uh, uh, can be addressed uh, in short order, relatively short order, and I do believe that uh, you'll see almost immediate uh, impact improvements in uh, the learning experience for your students as you improve uh, along these areas. So, Dennis, I'll, uh, I'll turn it back to you at this point. Thank you, Jeff. I don't have a lot to say. We've been talking for an awful long time now, um, so I want to turn it over to start to answer any of the questions or comments or suggestions that have come through the chat function. Hi, this is Sandra Dreheim again. Um, we have had a, a one or two comments, not any real questions, I would say, at this point. So I'd like to encourage attendees, if they'd like to type in some questions right now into their um, dialog box and hit send, we will try to answer those questions while we're still online here. But uh, I wanted to thank also Dennis and Jeff for a really great presentation. It was very robust and rigorous and comprehensive and uh, it was an extremely interesting report. Um, I am recording this webinar and I will make the recording available to everyone who attended today. Um, I'll make it available by sending out an email uh, later, probably within a day or two, with a link to the webinar recording. In that same email will be a uh, link or the actual uh, presentation document, the slide deck in a PDF format. So both the presentation um, by itself in slide deck form as well as the recording will be made available to all attendees and anyone else that would uh, care to receive that. So I just want to assure everyone that will be on the way to you. Uh, I do have one question that has come in. Uh, and here is that question for Dennis and Jeff. Why wasn't there any advance accounting for the second semester for seniors? Um, not sure I, I understand the question. Advanced accounting, we had advanced financial accounting in accounting 401 in the first semester of the senior year. We didn't have it in the sophomore year because in the sophomore year we've thrown in accounting information systems, taxation, and auditing. So not quite sure if they want to maybe re, re, reset it. I'm not quite sure what you mean, what the question means by not having advanced accounting. Uh, 
Thank you, Dennis. Appreciate that answer. Um, I've also had a couple of questions about uh, being able to get the teaching manual and view the entire report to have a thorough review, and I think that that is certainly possible as well, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, we can work with um, the work. We'll work with the team um, at WGI to make sure that all of the all of these reports we've been referring to. We've referred to Deliverable One, which is our review report, Deliverable Two, which is our recommendation report, and Deliverable Three, which is the teaching manual, or the teaching practice manual. So we'll work with the WG, WGI team. We know the, these have been sent off to to the to to UL, um, but we'll make sure that um, we work with. WDI and UL to make sure that these are made available to, to all interested parties. Thank you, Dennis. I do have one additional question that has just come in. Why was the short-term curriculum or sequence of courses uh, not in the report and could it be included is the suggestion. The short-term solution is in both deliverable one and deliverable two. Um, I'm just looking at my table of contents here. Um, it started on page 12 of deliverable one is our primary recommendation. Um, now, Oh, I guess, oh, sorry, maybe the question is we haven't actually put together like a table seven where we put all the, all the courses together. We can, you know, we can take that feedback and incorporate that into the report. It's just it, we didn't put it in because it was something that UL has prepared themselves. So it was theirs, it was their design, not ours, and so we're not trying to take credit for that. But we can, we can implement that into, into, as a table in our reports, absolutely. Thank you, Dennis. I'm going to wait a brief moment or two here in case there are any other questions. Okay, uh, there don't seem to be any more questions right now. Uh, so I think we will bring this particular presentation to a close right now. Uh, I thank everyone for attending, and I, again, I especially thank Dennis and Jeff for their uh, great presentation today. And again, I will follow up with all attendees, getting them a copy of the presentation and the recording. So thank you very much. This ends our webinar presentation for today. Okay, thank you. Can I just say we want to thank everyone for participating today, and we do want to thank everyone at, at UL that's been very helpful and provided us assistance during the review phase of our project. Where we are looking forward to following up on any more questions or comments that you have, so that we can get um, get these incorporated into our final version of our reports and get you moving on on implementing these. So thank you. And, and I will add, uh, we're certainly aware and and keeping. Uh, your country and your your uh, leaders and and your people uh, in our thoughts and prayers as you're going through this uh, this crisis. So please keep us informed. <laughs>